Hello everybody and welcome to the first ever episode of the Airgun World podcast. Bearing in mind this is the first episode, we thought we'd introduce you all to the hosts who you're going to be listening to over the coming weeks uh, and just have a bit of a, a general chit chat about what this podcast is going to be all about and uh, what we've all been up to. So if you're watching this, the guys on screen don't need any introduction, but if you're listening to this, we've got none other than Terry Doe, the godfather of air gunning himself. How are you doing, Terry? I'm doing very well in a, in a godfatherly sort of way. Good man. Doing good really man. Well. Loving my <laughs> retirement. Loving it. Excellent stuff. Okay, then we've got Matt Manning. <coughs> Matt doesn't need any introduction at all. He's probably one of the best uh, air gun hunters in the UK. Lo- knows loads and loads and loads about air guns. You're not too well, are you, Matt? Uh, I've got a bit of a head cold. It's much Mandarin. worse than my wife asks, but but for you guys, it's fine. <laughs> tell, me, tell it like it is, mate. It's man flu. We know it's bad. Yeah, I, I have got the Albus oil and strep seals at the ready. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on my knees. I'm on my knees here. <laughs> okay, so the other guy we've got with us is none other than Rich Saunders. Now, Rich, again, is a very, very experienced air gunner, hunter. And, Rich, you actually do, every single month you write in a magazine, you actually do all of our group tests, don't you? Yeah, and it, it's lovely to play with gear that you don't actually have to own. Yes. The sad thing is it all has to go back again at the end of the, of the, of the session. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's all good fun. Excellent stuff. Okay, so this is the first one we're doing. We're just going to have a little bit of general chit-chat. But going forwards, uh, we're splitting into two teams. So every two weeks, you're going to have Terry Doe and myself interviewing a studio guest. And then two weeks after that, you're going to have Matt and Rich Again, doing the same, interviewing the studio guests and, and talking about what they've been up to. Now, this is going out on the 22nd of December, I believe. So Merry Christmas to everyone watching and a Happy New Year. In two weeks' time from today, Terry and I are going to be talking to none other than Mike Herney from the shooting party about all things importing air guns, pellets, that sort of stuff, and distributing it to all the shops that you guys and girls out there can go and buy it. Um, and then... Two weeks after that, I think Matt and Rich, you may be interviewing the wee man himself, Tony B- Belas from Day State, BRK Brocock. That's the, that's the that plan. Right? That's the, if we can pin him down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what have you guys been up to? I mean, I've just come back from a trip to Ireland. I've been on holiday for a week. And I've eaten far too much, drunk far too much Guinness. So I haven't actually been out shooting for the last week or so. What have you guys been up to? I have I have been out hunting, uh, so I was out ratting a couple of nights ago on the farm. Actually, I've had quite a varied week. I was at a gig on Wednesday, and I went to see Ice Cube in Cypress Hill. But that's that's probably not the demographic that, that we're aiming at. So, yeah, yeah, back to the ratting. I mean, now, now the weather's colder. Um, it was really slow to get going, actually, this, this winter on, on most of the farms where, where I shoot rats. The weather stayed mild. It was wet, but it stayed mild. But now it's turning a little bit cold, and we've had some serious flooding down in my part of the world in Somerset, um, and it seems to be driving the rats, obviously, onto the farmyards for the shelter, the food, and certainly the higher lying farms where the rats have been flooded out off the lower ground. They're, they're starting to turn up in numbers there now, so it's starting to get exciting. Excellent stuff. Okay, so Rich, what have you been up to? You've been out, you're always out as well, aren't you? Yeah, lot, lots of times. I like Matt. I mean, this time of year, it's ratting, ratting, ratting. And, um, I like Matt, a lot of the rivers around by me have flooded out as well. So the rats are really something to come into the farms that I shoot on. And uh, one of my farms is a chicken farm. And in actual fact, it's a focus of the, uh, the air gun show on, on YouTube a week or so ago. Well, I think there's about 8,000 birds on the farm in two big chicken sheds. And every 18 months, about 4,000 birds from one of the sheds gets moved out. And the shed gets dragged back into a field so all the muck can be cleared up. And the rats that have been living underneath the shed, all of a sudden, there's no shed, so they don't know where to go. And um, just, I'm just shooting so many rats, I'm sick of the sight of them. Uh, <laughs> I went for about four nights in a row, and I lost count of about 300 rats. And um, that's an awful big pile of rats to burn up as well at the end of the night. But yeah, so lots of rats. A bit, bit of rabbit shooting as well. Um, one of my main missions, I tend to drive around in the truck and shoot out the window um, because it's just such a big area to cover. And the tracks have been really wet and muddy, so that's slowed things down a little bit. But uh, mostly get a few rabbits too, but mostly rats. So I'll be back on the squirrels next week. 
You, both you boys make me want to get out now. <laughs> really into Especially your, hearing your about tales of ratting. hunting. I well, know, yeah. oh 300, that's an unbelievable amount, isn't it? That's a lot of pellets. It's the only time I've ever been hunting and I've had to fill up with air and open a new tin of pellets. Yeah, superb. What about you, Terry? What have you been up to, mate? Well, the last three gigs I went to were the Mavericks, First Aid Kit and Teddy Swims. <laughs> So uh, I, Matt's not the only happening geezer on this screen at the moment, so, uh, and they were all brilliant. But um, I've been ratting and rabbiting, and mainly testing down at Bisley. I've um, I got I've got a load of gear from um, Highland Outdoors. Um, that RTI P3 I did for last month for this latest issue. Well, they sent me the col- yeah yeah. There's a bit of confusion about that. We're going to have to explain this, Dave. Or I say okay. we, I all mean right. you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, when I, when I got that rifle, there was a little cut, little paper swing tag on the trigger guard, and it said uh, performance compact, you see. And I thought right. that's what it was called. But what it was, it had a little ring around the performance. So if it had been a compact, it would have had a ring around the word compact. So it wasn't a performance compact. It was a P3 performance. But the one they sent me is the performance compact. It didn't have a swing tag. Anyway, I I briefly explained it. They sent me that. They sent me a superb pair of mounts that all the guys and all the tragic people at my club, like me, we're looking at these tier one mounts and they're all going, oh, my God, look at those. Oh, look at them. Even the Even the little box it comes in has got a metal push button to open it in the cardboard box. It's mad. <laughs> and the, all the, like, I got a little set, it's got a little um, spirit level set in the mount. And everyone's looking at them saying, oh, God, I've got to have these mounts. I've got to have it. And they are, they're 120 or 130 quid for a, a set of two piece mounts. But they're machined out of a solid billet and they're, uh, they're just jewelry, they're just air gun jewelry. They're, they're wonderful things, ludicrous money, but wonderful things. And, um, here's where, here's one situation I was in that Matt wouldn't have been in. And I doubt Richard would. They sent, um, a GPO, which I found funny, GPO scope. So I thought I'd have a post reticle. Hey, Matt. Hey, <laughs> GPO post reticle. Anyway, German Precision Optics. Okay. Um, Spectra 41650i. And I, I put it on the uh, P3. And at first shot, at, I always start the zeroing process at 12 yards. So first shot was about half inch high, half inch right. I thought, right, I'm there. I'm there. A few clicks on the turrets. Second shot miles out miles higher miles more right what on earth's going on here next did loads more altering next shots off the plate altogether into the ground i've taken the silencer off i'm looking to see if it's clipping i'm doing it. and then i finally did what we never do and i looked at the instructions on the turret and it's the other way around you know every time we twiddle down don't we no no no, no you don't you twiddle up down and you twiddle out for, for left on this one and you will not believe how non-intuitive that is for someone who's been doing it as long as we have and i got it and it's a superb thing my god they're not cheap they're 600 and something quid but it it is incredible but i'm still seriously struggling with the backwards turrets i'm you know i'm zero i've tried it on about three guns but that's what I've been doing, and I've been um, turning up at Bisley at seven o'clock in the morning, and um, I'm so energised, but I can't sleep at night. Still, it's great, isn't it? I love it, <laughs> absolutely love it, and I don't have press deadlines like you do. So, <laughs> so it's well, lo- I'm uh, just loving it. Excellent stuff. I'm glad to hear you've all been out and, and having a bit of fun. I think just before I went to Ireland, um, I popped up to see Jill at Range Right. I know you've been there, Terry. Yeah. Um, and one experience that was that. Reximex rifles coming out of Turkey. I mean, for years and years and years, the stuff that was coming out of Turkey was 50-50, to say the least, wasn't it? And Kral as well, obviously. Talking to Jill at Range Right and seeing their operation and, and what they do. Do you know, like, every single rifle, they sell loads of Crossman stuff, mm-hmm. all the Reximex, they sell Kral. Every single rifle that goes through the doors and out the doors of range right, every single rifle is tested, even including all the springers, all the Crossman springers that they sell, and they sell thousands of them. Every single one, they've got like a 10 point checklist. And they've been working really, really closely with Reximex over in Turkey. And I know, Matt, you reviewed uh, the Lyra 
a, a couple of issues ago. I reviewed it in the December issue. And, the, you know, it's a Turkish walnut stock PCP for less than 400 quid. And it's absolutely spot on, isn't it? I, I was surprised by how good it was. Also, though, I've got what I've hung on to is the Reximex uh, Pretensis, which is another gun yeah. you, you wouldn't expect. First, it's a really handsome looking gun, but also it puts pellets in the right place. Um, and at that price, it's mind blowing. But I think we've got to a point these days. There are very few bad air guns out there. Because, well, A, because it's such a competitive market, you, can, you, you get so much for your money these days. But also because of social media, everybody's got an immediate comeback. Um, and manufacturers, distributors, they can't get away with a substandard product these days. It depends how, how picky, I guess, you're going to be. If, you, if you're expecting a 400 quid Reximex to do the same job as a Vara HW100 or so, it's not realistic. But I'll tell you, they're, they're a lot closer together than their price tags will will dictate absolutely yeah and i, I mean, can do like, i've done groups that you couldn't tell which which rifle had done them you just couldn't tell you you wouldn't say oh yeah well that's from a 500 quid gun and that's from a 1500 quid gun it's we're now into the into the realms of it's doing a doing i don't know going around a racetrack in a in a fiesta and doing 100 miles an hour and doing it doing the same thing in a mercedes they're still 100 mile an hour but they're different experiences and it that's where we are now i think we're down to refinement because the basic performance yeah. is amazing for the money now. But, you know, if, if you look down a range of 30 metres, there's not an awful lot of difference in performance between guns that cost 500 quid and 1,500 quid, other than just the tactile interaction with the quality of engineering. You know, for, for a lot of guys who just want to shoot a few targets and the odd rat underneath his head, they don't need a 1,000 pound or 1,500 pound regulated rifle. You know, a good springer or a cheap PCP will do the job. You, you spend £400 now, you, you certainly get £400 worth of air rifle, certainly in most cases, and that sort of incremental improvement for each £100 you spend, between 200 300 400 500 you will see a quantifiable improvement usually with that extra spend. But there's kind of like a ceiling now that you have to start spending increments of 500 or a grand more to get a really quantifiable, yeah. noticeable difference in the performance of that gun. And, that, and if you can afford it and you want to pay that extra grand, yes, you will get a dream gun. But you, but you don't have to. Isn't it great that we've got that, though? We've got that option. Yeah. It's wonderful. We've got so many, so many tiers of, of where you want to be. You know, if you want to really want to push it and, and have something you're going to cherish and stand there and admire, you've got that if you want to pay for that. Or if you just want to go out and do a job and shoot 50 rats, you can do that for a, a quarter of the money. We've got yeah. the option now. The only thing we, we must be realistic about is that extra money. And as Matt so rightly says, once you've hit 500 quid, you're going to have to double that to get twice the gun and more probably, probably more treble it to get twice the gun than your 500 quid model. And you're, you're in a different territory it then. So you, we need to be realistic. The it takes a while for your shooting to get that extra benefit out of your spend also. And this is, this mm. is something I always come back to. Mm. A lot of people find out the hard way, certainly with live quarry shooting, you will never buy your way out of the, the field craft problem. Um, so no. even, no, even you if you've got a 200 pound air gun that's only accurate out to 20 yards, um, if, if you learn how to creep within 20 yards of what you want to shoot, you're fine. Um, I think this, this is a big problem in modern air gun shooting is that too many people haven't cut their teeth the, the hard way. They haven't done those hard yards that we all did as kids with inferior equipment that we probably quite resented having at the time. But now sat here, you know, as 47 year old Matt, I realized that the apprenticeship that I served with that, that kit that wasn't quite at the standard or anywhere near the standard of what I, I'm using now taught me so much and, and made me able to appreciate the extra 1% here and the extra 2% here of when you're using high-end optics or a top-end air rifle. Um, but, it, but it's all down to that long and frustrating apprenticeship, and a lot of people just don't quite realise that. It seems like there's more of a gulf between cheap PCBs and good PCBs. Um, you know, that, that performance gap is getting much, much smaller. But with Springers, I think there's still quite a gap between 
cheap springers and more expensive springers. You know, I see people who spend 180 quid on a, on a, on a cheap springer and, you know, frankly, they're struggling to hit you know, 20, 25 meters. So you give them a good springer and all of a sudden they're, you know, they're hitting the target every time. It just seems that there's a more of a gulf when it comes to the springer market than the PCPs in terms of price and performance. Yeah. Hopefully that will change. So, Terry, like you just said, isn't it great that we've got all that now, you know, the price gaps and the quality of the stuff? And I've actually written a little note down here on my piece of paper. And, and we can talk a little bit about the magazine in a second for those people listening and watching that have not au fait with it. But I've written here, there's, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be an air gunner than there is right now. Um, you know, we've got the magazine, Air Gun World. It's the only air gun magazine out there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the best. <laughs> but before there were, there were two other magazines and we've sort of amalgamated them all into to one big super mag. Um, you know, it's, I believe it's, it's the best air gun mag that there's ever been out there on the shelves. Mm. Um, but not only that, you know, we've got the YouTube channels that we've got. Um, Matt and, and Richard as well, you know, on the air gun show, which is on the, the shooting show on YouTube. Um, is that every two weeks, Matt? It's every two weeks. Every two weeks. Uh, yeah, the, the, the current episode, which is a Rich Saunders hunting package, frustratingly, is absolutely flying. I think it's approaching 40,000 views in about five days. Um, so, yeah, doing great. I, I, I fear that might now be dated when this podcast goes out. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's every fortnight. <laughs> it's, it's never dated, Matt, because it's there forever <laughs> on YouTube and anyone can watch it at any time around the world. You know, so we've, we've got the Air Gun Show on the Shooting Show on YouTube. We've also got Shooting and Country TV, uh, where we've got Gary Chillingworth, who does his Life at the Range uh, piece. I believe that's every two two weeks to a month. Um, and, of course, Mick Garvey as well. He's always out hunting on Shooting and Country TV. Um, yet there's never been a better time, I don't think, to, to gain knowledge from people who've been doing it for, for years and years and years, all their life. You know, every channel, hence how this podcast has, has popped up. You know, it's just another multimedia channel where we can all share our knowledge and learn a bit of st stuff as well from, from people in the trade and whatnot. Yeah, my view is very simple. I, <clears throat> I predate most of you guys, but um, mine was just a trial and error, more a ton of trial error all over the place, years and years behind the false belief that muzzle energy would cure everything. And that, that still hasn't gone for far too many people. They think if they're missing, they don't realise you're missing with 11 foot pounds. Even if you go and get yourself an, an FAC, uh, if you hit a rabbit in the wrong place with a 2-2 rimfire, it's, it's not going to be any more, you know, it's going to be less dead than if you, you put the 177 pellet in the right place at, at 11 foot pounds. But when I, when I started, all I had was a, a raving enthusiasm, which I still have. But the, the information was just what your, your mates did and what you learned yourself. And then Air Gun World came out in 77 and, and things really changed. It got us together. It pushed me toward a club where I had like-minded weirdos, the same as I was, who was really <laughs> into what we were doing. And it all, it all went from there. But as you, you are absolutely right, there's never been a better time for learning than there is now and and i hope between all of us and more more people out there we're going to we're going to increase that we're going to cut down on the on the errors and give them more positive stuff to work toward and be better quicker because not only does it benefit the individual the more individuals we turn on to how fantastic this sport of ours is the more that they will help protect it like we do and the more the bigger voice we have and and the more people that that will keep an eye out for for something they love and it's welfare so you know we've all got a duty to it to to the people and to the sport and this is the time to do it and without a doubt social media in its many forms is is got to be used in a very positive way and it can be we all use it positively and and for the consumer it's fantastic yeah i, I think youtube is for me it's probably the, or you know online social media is it's probably the biggest impact because you know, magazines have been around for a long time. Um, but I think, you know, when I look, look back to when I first started shooting as a kid, you know, I try and sort of stalk rabbits and, and they just used to run away and it's very frustrating. And 
I decided one day just to have a sit down and see what happened. And all of a sudden I discovered ambushing. Now I had, had no idea that that was a tactic before. Um, I thought I'd invented the thing. But now, you know, you watch a bit of YouTube and you see some guy doing it and, do, and other things. And all of a sudden you learn so much quicker. And I, I think for me, the, the, the moving word, the, the moving picture is, is a lot more um, impactful for a lot more people now than than uh, the magazine probably ever were, and to my mind, the magazines fill that kind of in depth insight and knowledge um, requirement. Still, YouTube is um, it gives you that sort of instant learning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for me, and probably for many people these days, after a day sat at a screen, I may not feel inclined to spend another. 10 minutes, half an hour at a screen. So I'd, I'd like to pick up a magazine and have a mug of coffee and relax that way. But yeah. when you want that quick fix of information, and it's like anything these days, it, 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 I don't know, change a tap washer, change a ba- uh, battery in your watch, um, zero an air gun. It's just a quick two, three minute video. You've seen it mm-hmm. unfolding in real time. It's, it's just that, that tutorial element of it is amazing. When so much of our gear is getting more complicated, you know, like, digital night vision scopes. They're very hard things to communicate through the written word. You know, literally a picture is a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And you show a video on it, and all of a sudden, you know, with an accompanying piece of text maybe in a magazine, and all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a lot clearer. You know, whereas we didn't have that level of technology to have to communicate years ago. No, absolutely. I mean, well, let's talk about the magazine. So we've got the, the January issue. That's on sale now. The thing is with the magazine is that as far as gear reviews goes, we get a hell of a lot of new gear where we get all of it. It all goes into this magazine. As soon as it comes out, it's either on the cover or or it's inside. Um, and obviously the YouTube stuff, that sort of complements that. But that, a lot of the time that comes afterwards, you know, after it's been in the mag. I mean, for instance, in this, this January issue, um, you've got Terry. You're doing the RTI Arms P3, not the compact. <laughs> um, Matt, you've just reviewed the, the BSA R12 SLX, the new one, the new side lever. Um, I've mm-hmm. got uh, the the Curvin Airbus, which I've done as my editor's test. I mean, that's another Turkish rifle. Really nice bit of kit. That's sold, actually, by Mike from the, the shooting party. And, Rich, you've, you've done uh, a group test on four uh, infrared night vision add-ons yeah, you know add-ons, the previous yeah. issue you did dedicated uh day night scopes that's not for everybody some people don't like to shoot during yeah. the daytime with a digital scope but these these uh add-ons that you can bolt onto your 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 normal day scope i mean they're becoming ever more increasingly popular aren't yeah. they best of both worlds and you can get thermal add-ons now as well and you know, they, they have the benefit of, of enabling you to shoot with just one rifle. You don't have to have a separate rifle set up uh, for a dedicated night vision scope. You know, you can shoot in the day, pop it on the front or the back when the sun goes down, and carry on. Yeah. No, I love I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I grew up in the shooting with a torch or a lamp strapped to my gun era. And I remember when the, the night sight stuff came out, you know, with the, the screen on the top and the big yeah. camera and everything. And that was such a huge step change. And yeah, it's not that long ago. And all of a sudden, we've moved into dedicated night vision scopes, uh, or day night scopes, and now add, and add ons as well. And it seems to be a sector that's moving faster than anything else. And that, you know, that's a good thing. But I think it's also a, um, it's a troubling thing for some customers or some consumers because they literally don't know what to get because there's just so many out there. Um, mm. So yeah, so hopefully that, that I always with the group test try and give folks a flavour of the options that are open to them, um, and give them a little bit of a start point before they go and, and put some hard cash down. That's probably going to do us for this section of the, the podcast. I mean, we've introduced each other, told the, the listeners what's going to be coming up in the next few months. Um, one of the things that's going to be a regular slot on these podcasts is listeners. Q and A's. Obviously, this is the first episode, so it's going to be readers' Q and A's. We've got some uh, questions. I believe you've got some as well, Terry, from, from yep. readers of the magazine. If 
you're listening to this, watching this, and you want to ask us questions for the future, you can email me, dave.barham at fieldsportspress.com, or you can hit us up on our social media pages on Facebook and just drop us a, a message on there. We'll do everything we can to answer your questions. So this question is from Nathan Jenkins. He says, the cameras that you wear at hunting, do you wash them as usual in the washing machine? The reason I wonder this is because wouldn't really clean fresh smelling clothes send a scent off into the field and scare away whatever you're hunting. I usually wash mine with no fabric conditioner, but my wife washes them and they smell like flowers for days. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know about you guys, but I tend to try and not wash my hunting clobber. If I do wash it, it's probably once a year. I mean, that that little. And then even then, once it's been washed, I hang it out in the garden and wait for it to rain for a couple of days. Um, what's, what are your guys' thoughts on this? You must have experienced this before. Like if you're ratting in a, in a yard, you know, with lots of people moving around and stuff, it probably doesn't matter so much. But certainly if you're out, stalking rabbits um mm. then yeah it's in i i i never wash my coats the shooting coats because i think they're just too complicated to do that and they're probably the stinkiest things um but um yeah i i, I never worry about it too much to be honest um mainly because i think my boots will probably stink and my coat will always stink and there's very little else that i'm wearing there is some stuff I'm wearing. I don't want to frighten people. But, you know, the, once you take into account the, the stinky coat, I think I'm covered. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite paranoid about it. If, if I, for instance, if I think I'm going to be going rabbit shooting of an evening and I've a shower in the morning, I won't put deodorant on after having a shower because I think that's having a really strong smell. Um, my, my good mate Kev Hawker always has a really stinky air freshener in his car. And I really resent having to put my hunting clothes in there because you come out stinking of vanilla. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I am quite paranoid about it. Wash my shooting clothes as little as possible. And I, I like to think that my jacket is like a little cocoon that smells like all of the leaf mold that I've been sitting in or the, the farms that I've been on. And it's masking all, all of that, that human smell within it. And I also think that clothes can feel a bit stiff when they've come out of the wash. Um, so the more, the more you wear them, they, they sort of loosen up and become softer and quieter. I think also the last time one of my shooting jackets went in the washing machine, the washing machine ended up full of air gun pellets. So there's a lesson there. I'm with Matt yeah. on this one. I think I've washed a hunting jacket twice in my life, and on both times, uh, pig manure was involved. So that was to to get rid of the smell for my benefit. Um, but any any other time, no way, no. I don't. I do what Matt does. I don't do the deodorant thing. Um, I, I love my aftershaves, but I will not be wearing. I'll, I'll, even if I'm having a shave before I go, I'll even sort of close the pores of my face with cold water or hot water rather than, than put aftershave or something on. Um, it, whether it makes a difference or not, it makes a difference in my head. So um, I don't feel so good about being out there if I've not prepared everything. So I, I do everything in my favour. But <clears throat> as for the washing, they say, I'll oh, use pure soap, use that. Don't use anything unless it's absolutely smothered and it's stink stinking my hunting clothes are, are they hang in the in the fishing tackle shed they're not hanging in polite society i won't inflict that on that, the general household but that's where they hang and they can absorb any amount of aromas in there you dave knows better than anyone what lovely smells come out of a wet landing net um <laughs> or a carp sack or something like that so yeah they can have those i'm, I'm happy for my hunting clothes to absorb that but uh no nah, don't wash my stuff never Ter Ter terry's made a brilliant point there saying it makes a difference in his head and i think there's so much to be said for that mm. so i don't i don't know what rabbits mm. squirrels rats etc can smell but if i believe they can't smell me i feel a little bit more confident it's the same with camouflage mm. none of us really know what our quarry can see we don't really know if camo makes a huge difference but when i'm wearing camo and i've got head net on and i've got my green gloves over my over my pink skin i feel a little bit more invisible and i just think that it breeds confidence and you believe you've got a bit of an edge and totally. you don't feel like you're wasting your time. Absolutely. Okay, so here's another question. You know, we were talking about getting kids into the sport. This one's from Mike Powell. Um, he said, what rifle would you suggest for an eight-year-old lad? My son has shown an interest in shooting with me, both when hunting and at the range, and I like to get my starter rifle set up. 
do they make rifles especially for kids these days i know they do because i've bought them for my kids um what about you rich what what do you suggest for for an eight-year-old lad i think there's a school that says you know teach them how to shoot a springer to start with and and what have you but it's a little bit like like fishing you know if you take little kids fishing they want to catch some something every two minutes they don't want to sit there for hours and hours and hours it's a bit with the, with a PCP. I think you know, if you give a kid a springer, and they're going to miss tin cans and what have you, and they're soon going to get bored. So I would say start them off with a you know, even a cheap PCP, ideally one made for a junior, so that they're going to hit what they aim at, and that's going to get their enthusiasm up. And then you can move them on to more, you know, to springers and things, and and refine their technique. But yeah, I I, I think um, yeah, the you know, BSA do a junior. Um, rifle, some of the yeah, the, the ultra JSR come up nice and small as well. And I, I think, yeah, give them a PCP and get get their enthusiasm up. I couldn't agree more with that. I'm funny enough. I've just I'm going to be sending you, Dave, a, a one pager from a question I was asked by a chap who said it, his um, 13 year old a grandson um, is is going to teach him to shoot. He's got an extensive collection of rifles, but should he start him where he started with a, a, a Springer, an old Springer and open sights? And just like Richard said, perfect answer, no. This guy in his collection, he's got an, um, an S500. Um, get the kid having success. Get some success. Get him turned on, not grafting yet. If his technique needs sharpening up and yet in later time, yeah, let him control a Springer. Once he knows he can do it, once he knows where the fun is, springers are still the greatest means of training your technique there is. Everything you can do with a springer, you can do with a PCP, but not the other way around. But just like Richard says, you, the kid wants to be turned on because there are so many diversions out there with, with like video games and all sorts of stuff um, that they can get guaranteed degrees of success in. Get the kid turned on. I would personally recommend the, uh, the, the, the junior BSA or... If you're not going to spend too much, too much money, get a second-hand Air Arms S200, um, especially one of the older generation ones where you can maybe cut stock down a little bit. Uh, perfectly accurate rifle. Sit, you don't need mag- magazines or anything, really. Single shot will do to start with. Get them doing the fundamental thing that turned us on from the start, hitting a target and the buzz you get from that. What's your opinions, Matt, on this? Look. Completely agree with those models and with the advice for starting with a PCP. And I think actually, I found with my kids, they they enjoyed that instant gratification of shooting PCPs and feeling like they were fairly proficient shooters. But then on the garden range, that became a little bit monotonous. And then it's time to roll out the spring gun because then you've got the kick. Yeah. Uh, there's just a bit more going on. There's the mechanical side of it, which is good fun. And, and then they feel like they're going up another level, which is it's kind of a reverse of what too many people believe what I think it's it's quite easy as a parent to be guilty of just wanting your kids to do to follow the same course of what you did you know the old brake barrel spring was good enough for me it's good enough for them well actually engage them make them feel competent with a PCP and then bring in that bit of excitement with with a with a mechanical spring gun a bit later on I think when oh. I think back to when I started you know shooting guns 40 45 years ago you know I wanted the best rifle that I could get my hands on. And my friends always had better rifles than me. And if one of them had had a PCP 45 years ago, I wouldn't have even considered a spring. And you'd want that gun. You'd want the best thing. And to make kids start off with old technology now, I think um, it's a little bit cruel, really. Well, <laughs> let, let me hit, the, hit you from this, from this point. Um, I agree with absolutely everything you've all said. My eldest daughter, Mia, I got her started. She started shooting when she was about 10 years old. And, yeah, she was shooting my PCPs off the bench in the back garden, absolutely loving it. But then she sh- she saw me, and I actually got to start taking some photos of me for, for rifle tests. She was watching me shooting standing up. And uh, she couldn't manage that with my PCP rifles. So I invested in a Webley VMX Cub. Nice little short, lightweight springer. It's only I think it's only six foot pounds, so it's sort of half UK power, which is easier for someone, a little person to cock. That's another thing with springers. A, a full power UK springer takes some cocking, doesn't it? And uh, yeah, so 
she went from shooting my PCP every weekend off the bench to absolutely not wanting to shoot that anymore and spend as much time as she could shooting standing mm. with her own brake barrel in the garden. Mm. But she'd already had that training about safety, yeah. trigger safety, control. She yeah, had success yeah. as well, though, hadn't she? She, she so needed it's a the different challenge. version of the buzz that she was getting, which is great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so you've got a couple of questions as well, Terry, haven't you? Yep. <clears throat> I've, got, um, I've got three questions. The first one's going to be the quickest one ever because I already know the answer to it. Um, I've asked, do any of us change our trigger settings in the winter to compensate for the cold hands and all that? Here's my answer. No. <laughs> no, I don't. Not ever. But no. a couple of my mates do. A couple of my mates do. Um, so do any of you guys do it? My only proviso on that, the cautionary, is if you've got it set so lightly that a slightly colder finger is going to resi- is going to risk um, a- an unwanted trigger uh, shot, then you've got it set too light in summer. And I'm on about winter. So get it to a position where it's practical. It's a hunting gun. You're out in the field. You know, temperatures will vary. Conditions will vary. And your hands can get cold. I'm lucky I don't, I've never felt, I've been out all my life, I don't feel that. But if, if you're setting your trigger so light that you're worried about it going off, you know, going off because you can't, you've lost a bit of sensitivity in your tr- trigger finger, then you're, you're running on too light a setting, in my opinion. I don't like light triggers. I like a long first stage and a rock hard second stage. I know where it's going to break. That's just the way I shoot, which is hence why most of the guns that we get sent for review that come out of the factory come out of the shops they're normally pretty spot on for how i like to shoot you know i've i've, I've never been one for adjusting that trigger so that you blow on it and and off it goes yeah. many years ago we conducted a survey in the magazine to find out about readership habits and stuff and i asked a part of the survey was how many of you alter your trigger how many of you adjust your trigger? You know that from the we had something like I don't know two and a half thousand replies or something over a course of a year and a half. Less than twenty percent of shooters ever adjusted their trigger. You try to sell a non-adjustable trigger. You try to sell a gun with a non-adjustable trigger. You won't do it. But less than twenty percent of them. And now we've got the editor of Airgun World saying he doesn't do it either. So, yeah, you'd think everybody like us, tweak, 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 tweak. They don't, you know. They absolutely don't. Maybe some more should, but that was it that time ago. And we had plenty of adjustable triggers then. We've had them for many years. And less than 20% said they do adjust their trigger. I I think certainly when you're spending 750, 1,000, 1,500 pounds on an air gun, it should leave the factory with a pretty well set trigger. I do Mm. like. Mm. to know that a trigger is adjustable because using several guns, I like them all to feel fairly similar. And that sort of boils down to what I was saying earlier, but I don't like Mm. to really change anything. So at least if I'm shuffling between guns, the triggers have some similarity between them. But as long as it's relatively crisp and predictable and not hair light, there's no harm in leaving it alone. I think the, the problem that we all face is changing kit so frequently. Um, and it's a, it's a lovely problem to have, you know, in this privileged position of getting our hands on all of this kit, you know, week in, week out. But my goodness, that lack of familiarity doesn't have affect your shooting. I, I can remember back when I had one air rifle, I was a way better shot than I am now because I was just so ruthlessly familiar with it. Um, so, yeah, back to the original mm-hmm. point. The only reason I would adjust a trigger is to make it feel similar to the triggers on my other go-to guns. That's why I do it. That's why I do it. I'm like Dave. I like a long first stage. Give me plenty of micro adjustment time and then a definite stop, absolutely a definite stop. And all of my guns, I use a hardcore of of about five guns, five rifles. I want their triggers to be as identical as I possibly can get them. And um, that's the only reason I generally I adjust them because most, most rifles these days have got decent triggers on them. What about you, Rich? Yeah, I, I, I would rather have a, a trigger that, that is set heavier than lighter because I don't think you get surprised by a heavy trigger, whereas you get surprised by one that's too light. It goes off before you're ready. Um, but I, I very rarely adjust them out of the box. You know, um, 
I, I tend to shoot with the same core uh, number of rifles, and if, if, if I have to shoot with another one for whatever reason, then I'll, I'll spend some time tinkering around with it. But uh, you know, I now realize it's to get it to feel like all my other guns. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, I, I find out of the box they're, they're usually pretty good. We, we had a guy, funny enough, talking about uh, triggers being set too light. We had a guy at our club who came down with an HW80, and he had the trigger set so light that um, you know, it was the thing was going off with, with him barely touching the trigger. And we got a little. We always know where he sat because there's a little clue. It's a good group right in the roof of the of the shooting gallery. Where when he brought the barrel up, bang, it went off. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'd rather have a heavier trigger than a light one. No, exactly the same. You know, once you, you've got settled and you know your rifle and your scope and your trigger setting, yeah. don't change it. Why would you? These are good questions, and I'm keen to learn from them as well. Um, do any of us use anything in, a, in the hunting field, anything other than roundhead pellets? I must admit, I, I was using, I won't say the brand uh, for a long time, but I was using some well-known, good quality Diablo pellets. And um, they just seem to so suddenly go off a little bit. Whether the manufacturing process had changed or whatever, they just seem to go off. And I switched to um, the uh, JSB Hades pellets. So they're still a round head, but they have those kind of funny little kind of scoops out of them. So they're kind of semi, um, um, you know, dum dum kind of pellets. And I thought that they would be rubbish because, you know, they're not um, a pure surface and, and there's potential for there to be variances in manufacturing but i have to say they've been fantastic and i i use them um certainly in all my 2-2 rifles now because they've just become my go-to pellet but before that yeah always zone pellets so yeah i i use predator pro oh. uh, polymags fairly recently quite frequently and was surprised because they kind of went against everything that i'd discovered and been preaching about not using pellets of elaborate design and then you've got this, what is effectively a dum dum with a, with a plastic appendage stuck to the front of it, and I, I, my expectations were incredibly low. I couldn't believe how, up to certainly mid range, how accurate they were through some of my guns. And they did genuinely have some improved expansion. They were hitting harder. I used them for ratting, and, and still do from time to time, very successfully. But by and large, a quality domed pellet for virtually everything. And I think Terry's the one here with the target shooting pedigree. They are the go-to pellet for any field target HFT shooters that are regularly picking up silverware. They're using these quality domed pellets. Now, for a hunter, we're trying to shoot things in the head. If you shoot something in the brain, it doesn't matter what shape that pellet is. It, that that, that mm. creature might flip about a bit, but it's dead. Um, it just hasn't sunk in yet. So I, I think, yeah, we are we are dealing with even at FAC power, relatively low power levels. Precision is like the, the greatest tool in our toolbox. Uh, and that comes first. So the, the pellets that give you that consistent precision with your air rifle are the ones I believe you ought to be using. And nine times out of 10, I think they are the quality domed pellets. I have a little rider on that. Many, many years ago, they brought out a pellet called um, a Silver Jet. Okay, triple ring, pointy. Yeah. All right. A silver Jet had a beam and uh, silver it was in a, jet. In a cardboard box. Yeah. That's well, Beeman nicked the nicked the as he did so many appropriated so many other <laughs> ideas. But the Silver Jet was was in a flat box with a with a mountain blue and silver flat. Anyway, mm -hmm. to me, I mean, we are talking pre air gun world. When I saw these in the um, in the gun shop, I thought, "Oh my god!" Well, obviously, that's it. I'm, I'm gonna have these, and I use them on rats at fairly close range. Probably the least thing they were they were sort of for, because you'd think they just go zipping straight through. Well, in those days, I, I had no real uh, appreciable brain, so they were knocking these things over. They're knocking rats over at five yards to fifteen yards, and you you're getting that bot sound when you know the real smack and so i examined a couple i, I put the, I put a couple of rats on, on a big old uh, sleeper and i cut them up i cut them open and every time i found the silver jet on its side it was on its side sometimes it was facing the other way now either the bands 
were gripping flesh or bone as it went through, or it was pivoting on the point and tumbling. But either way, those pellets were 177 when they went in, but whatever caliber the length is of them, that's what mm-hmm. they were when once they arrived. They tumbled and they imparted more. They didn't I didn't have as many through shots as I did with my, my trusty wasp, my lovely slightly too tight Ely wasp that I was using. But those silver jets, they were in one seven seven this is. They were absolutely lethal through my uh, HW35E because I, I was pretty flash. I had a 35E <laughs> then. Um, it had a longer barrel, so it must have been more powerful, I thought. I was doing about 10 foot pounds, it turned out. And uh, I shot thousands of rabbits with that. And I mean, well, vermin, anyway, with that yeah. HW35E um, with a single point sight on it as well, or all the open sights. But those, those little silver jets, they tumbled. And I can see why they tumbled. It's either the point was tipping them over or they were grabbing the, the rings, the ribs on them were grabbing flesh or something on the way through and spinning them. But for whatever reason, they did it. But as you say, Matt, a, a 177 round head to the brain, good night. There's no degrees of dead. They're just dead. So, As a kid, I, I used, um, and we all did, um, H&N pointed um, yeah, for no other reason other than they were pointy. And I remember shooting one day, and the sun must have been just the right position. And I could see the pellets kind of yep. spiraling. Yeah, I've and seen I that. thought, oh, mm. this isn't good. And then I moved on to kind of dabbling pellets, and all of a sudden, you know, boots I think just because you know the potential for a point to become slightly damaged and offset is going to mm. spoil the balance on a pellet. They weren't as well manufactured as they, as they were as they are now. Yeah, right. Final, third question, may I? Last question. Come on. We'll right. wrap it up. Okay, then. We have night vision. We have thermals. What do you think is the next great development? A combination of both, I reckon. If someone yeah, brings a scope that's out, what I would say. it's a thermal scope that you can yeah. press a button and it goes to night to infrared. With a main know, range finder in it. Yeah. For about 500 quid. I think... Yeah, I, I think I, I, I'm, I've used several thermal scopes um, on review and what have you, and 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 they're fine. I think they're much better for bigger quarry, like you know, if you're shooting centre path for foxes or something. But um, I think for air gun quarry, you know, rats typically they're just for me they just don't give enough definition. You don't know its head from its backside sometimes. So I think rabbits, it's okay. I, I've I've got in the habit. I, I use a thermal spotter. Um, which is just the best thing in the world. Yep. And then I use infrared scopes uh, for actually shooting. Um, so in my mind, it'd be something that would perhaps have a sort of a like a spotting capability to it um, that you could then turn into a, a kind of a reticle infrared um, scope, targeting scope. Um, and I agree with Terry, I think uh, some kind of rangefinder functionality is an absolute must. You know, for air gun shooting. Mm. That's we should make one. I, I can't imagine what the next big thing will be. I mean, that's, that's the amazing thing with it, isn't it? We, we never see these things coming, and then when they do come along, we wonder how we ever got by without them. The sort of, the support, the sticks and tripods that are coming onto the market that we're using increasingly often now are coming on leaps and bounds, getting lighter. Um, yeah, some amazing stuff out there. Not, not all of it is stuff you'd want to carry around the field. And again, it comes back to that are we all becoming lazy shooters should should we be going back to actually you know, relying on our, our, our field craft and our shooting skills rather than shooting off the sticks i think there's a balance to be struck um and why, why not take advantage of something that makes you more effective particularly when you're dealing with live quarry but um no i i don't know what the next big thing is likely to be so i, I look forward to seeing it we all wait in anticipation. I think ballistic calculators will become more of a thing on more scopes now. It's it's just starting to be introduced. I know ATN had one with their ABL add-on a few years back, but it seems to be increasingly a sort of a must-have feature now on on quite a few night vision scopes. That seems to be the sort of the next differentiator. I think. Yeah. Is is there one that enables you to map okay. yet? Like. You can plot. You can plot in a, a zero at ten yards. A plot in a zero at twenty. Plot in yep. a zero at thirty, forty, fifty. Part will do and that. It will join the gaps. Yeah. Who does that, Terry? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, the par. No, I think it's the par eight. Um, I think I might be wrong, but I think that one does it. Um, the the, the NV Double Eight did it, or the NV Double Eight, the later one, and then the, the new par DS Thirty Five does mm. it. Um, right, it gives so you it's the not range, just working on the ammo. On the vertical cross here, you get a cross. You get a cross yeah, lighting so up you, on the vertical cross here with a range on it. That's yeah, yeah, but, but that's that's going on the data that you right. input for those ranges, and then it will it will yeah. bridge yeah, the gap yeah, in between um, them. I think Russ Douglas, Russ Douglas covers it um, in this month's issue. You have to put things like the distance of the sight line, center of the sight line, and the ball line, um, the ballistic coefficient, the the caliber inside propeller, all all of that, and it is a, a complete pain. And someone like me would have to get a, a nine year old in to off his video game to, to do it, but. Once it's in, and I have footage on my phone of somebody with an FAC taking rabbits at 100 yards plus with a 60-foot-pound air gun, and it's ju he's just scoping them. The cross appears, tells him, you know, the range and what aim point, and they're just yeah. going. They're just folded. They're right and center. I, yeah. I'd love one of those. I would love something like that. Um, I, I used the DS-35, and, and, yeah, my experience is the same as yours, Terry. I the one, the one tip I would pass on, and I've found this through a bit of experience, is that you know, if you set your normal zero at 30 meters, so you know on, on your crosshairs with no range finding, you know you're you're on you're on zero, and then you move out to say 40 meters, the ballistic calculator might give you a slightly different impact point, and and yeah, and at 50 meters the same again. And what I've discovered is that that comes down to you know if you're zeroing at 30 meters. You may hit, think that you've hit a perfect group of five pellets it's right in the middle, but in actual fact, you might be an eighth of an inch out. Of course, when you go to forty or fifty meters, that eighth of an inch gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I've what I've tend to do now is I, I'll zero at thirty, then I'll shoot with the ballistic calculator at forty, fifty, sixty, and I'll I'll adjust the uh, the revised aim point um, to hit onto those groups because that gives you much purer yeah. adjusted. Aim point. Mm. And, yeah, there's yeah, a capacity I, to edit, isn't there, Rich? Yeah, you yeah. can edit the results. Yeah, that, that's what yeah, I would appreciate because I I have real trouble trusting ballistic calculator. I'm still I'm still a hold over and hold under man. <laughs> I, I, I just think I I, I know what that what that does. I've, I've practiced <laughs> it on too. paper, yeah. therefore it does it in the field. Um, but yeah, if I could plot it more in between, the then I would probably feel more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're going to hold under, hold over, hold under, or use a ballistic calculator. It all comes down to having a rangefinder at night to tell you what you need to do. Mm. You know, without that, you know, I find it very hard to, to, to shoot accurately at night. I think okay. we've got a duty to be the best we can be, and especially as oh, Matt yeah. says with live quarry, it's our duty. We we need to be the best, the, the most clinical hunters we can possibly be, and especially with things like rats. You, you know, it's yes, we enjoy doing it, but you, it's vermin reduction. You're not going to give them a sporting chance. You just want to switch them off. It, it, we owe them that. And, and that, yeah. this new technology will allow us to be better at what we do. All right, then, folks. So uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and watching and tuning in. Uh, obviously, thank you to the other hosts who have joined us, Richard, Matt, and Terry. Um, Terry and I will be back in two weeks' time with Mike Hurley from the shooting party. In the meantime... Grab yourself a copy of Airgun World. Um, you can subscribe to this. We've got actually got a Christmas offer on at the moment, which is 25% off. And I think that works out at £44.99. That's for 13 issues of the magazine delivered to your door or onto your electronic device if you just want a uh, digital subscription. Um, but all of our subscriptions now come with FASA insurance included which gives you loads of millions of pounds public liability. I believe that everyone that shoots, whether you're sitting at, in your garden, whether you're on a range, whether you're out hunting, everyone should have insurance of some form or another. And, uh, yeah, you get it included with uh, Airgun World subscription. Just uh, head over to airgunshooting.co.uk, click on the Shop tab, and you'll see all of the subscription offers on there. So, yeah, I'd just like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And Terry and I will see you in two weeks' time. Bye.